Isn't that good? That's good. That's good. I am very conflicted tonight. Um, I'm wearing a Coca-Cola shirt and I'm drinking Pepsi One. <laughs> and it's an OCD person's nightmare, isn't it? Yes. It's like, what do you do? What, what does one just, I, I, I don't know. I'll put it there for a second. My name is Arlene. I'm a Christian in recovery from drugs, alcohol, and codependency. I want to welcome anyone who happens to be new today, you know, because coming to a recovery program um, can be scary. We all know that because we've all been there, you're, but you're not alone. Every single one of us here today has experienced the fear of recovering and the fear of not recovering from our problems, right? Because fear, it's this universal thing. It, there's nobody who isn't affected by fear. In fact, um, way back in 1933, we're going to like reel it all back. In 1933, uh, when Franklin D. Roosevelt was president of the United States, um, he accepted his election um, as president with this speech that included this famous quote. He said, so first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, nameless unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes the needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. That's deep, isn't it? You know, 1933 was a long time ago, but I think Frankie had a universal chord that he hit there, right? Because <clears throat> fear is paralyzing. And fear does keep us from advancing in any area of our life. Instead, what fear does is it makes us want to retreat. It, it, when we know that where we are um, here, um, our problems, our addictions, our compulsive behaviors, um, our hurts, habits, and hangups, when we know that here is no longer any good, uh, when our addictions and afflictions, compulsions uh, have gotten the best of us and here is no longer any good and it's not working for us, fear is the thing that prevents us from going over there to the better place that we need to be. Fear keeps us stuck, or worse yet, this is even worse, uh, fear makes us go backwards, right? And although I guess intellectually, this is me, although intellectually, I do know that President Roosevelt is right. I do know that there's nothing to fear but fear itself. Uh, still, I gotta say, when it comes to my scary uh, situations, when it comes to my recovery journey, uh, when it's frightening uh, to me, well, if I'm truthful, I kind of think uh, that I'm unique. Okay, I think I'm unique because I don't know about yours, but my recovery is really complex. <laughs> it's very, very complex. It's far more complex than your recovery. I'm just telling you. My problems are far more complex than your, than your problems. The stuff that goes on in my life as I stumble through the 12 steps of recovery, trying to follow Jesus, I mean, the stuff that goes on in my life, I mean, it can be terrifying sometimes with all sorts of ramifications and consequences and landmines if I step on the wrong, do the wrong move or, or choose the wrong decision. It's, uh, my, my life is tough. <laughs> I got a hard life. Uh, it's, easy. I mean, I, it's easy to tell you uh, that you should get over your fears, but you don't got my fears, okay? Mine are tougher. Can you relate? Yeah, right? Everybody can. And I think what we need, each and every one of us, what we need is a way to overcome the fear of going forward in our recovery and to not get stuck or to retreat. And that's why uh, tonight's lesson, as we enter into the fourth step, um, is called courage. It's called courage because I think that's what we need. Now, I'm talking about all this fear stuff because... Um, as we begin to talk about the four, working the fourth step of the 12 steps of recovery, it's a place where a lot of people get stuck. A lot of people get stuck in the fourth step. Uh, in the first three steps, first of all, let's, let's review. In the first three steps, first we had to admit that our addiction or, or affliction, compulsive behavior, hurt, habit, or hang up um, had us beat and our lives were a mess, right? That was step one. And, and, and because of it, step two said that we needed some sort of outside power to help us get right. 
A and once we decided that, yes, we did need some sort of outside power, then step three was we grasped onto that power uh, to help us, and we called that power God. And that was step one, two, and three, and they were tough steps. Those are tough steps, but now we have to go further. We have to go to step four. Read it with me, it's on the screen. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Hey, you know, just in case we missed it, let's read it again. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves, and now continue on. Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations 340. Okay, so I want to backtrack now for a second and talk about the 12 steps in general. You know, last Friday, if you were here, if you were here last Friday night, uh, we had something, uh, an interesting new format called the Ask It Basket, where everybody got to write down the questions that they might have about steps one, two, and three, and we gathered them all up, and then we had a panel of people that were answering, trying their best to answer those questions. It was really um, a, a lot of fun. Um, but one of the questions that we didn't get to answer, and it was a good question, it was a really, really good question, and, and I want to address it um, uh, here, uh, and it's about the 12 steps in general. The question was uh, along this line. It said, since the 12 steps didn't come into existence until AA began in the 1930s, how did people manage to recover before that? It's a good question, isn't it? Isn't that a good question? No, it's a good question, but the question assumes um, that AA invented the 12 steps. It assumes that AA invented the 12 steps, and AA did not invent the 12 steps of recovery. In reality, the Bible and Jesus uh, have been saving people from destruction and breaking their chains of sin far longer than AA has been around, right? But what the 12 steps did, why we use the 12 steps, is that the first 100 folks in AA who had recovered from alcoholism, it was a miracle, and they got together and they said, what exactly happened here? How exactly did we recover from this seemingly hopeless state of mind and body? And then they backtracked and they tried to recreate in, in words some simple steps that described what God had done in them and how they had responded to God. And, and then they wrote those, those, those principles and steps down in order, and, and they thus the steps came into existence. Um, it was God who worked these steps in them first. They didn't create the steps and then present them to the world as a program. God worked the steps in them, and then they wrote it down and they shared it with the world. See, and they just wrote it down. I tell you this so that you can see the steps are actually God's will for folks who need recovery. They are not of man. They are of God. They are a gift to those of us who suffer from the sorts of issues that need recovery. They're a gift. They're a way that we can connect to God in a special way. So the first three steps, they turn us to God. And the rest of the steps, well, they help us to go closer to him so that we can recover. The fourth step, making our moral inventory, uh, writing it down on paper, all the good and the bad and the ugly about our life, the fourth step breaks the power of darkness in our life. See, in the fourth step, we write down the inventory of our wrongs. We take a pen and a piece of paper and we, we get at it. We just start writing an inventory of our wrongs, the consequences of our actions, um, the causes of our actions, we, our resentments, our fears. We write it all down. It's our life story. It's no secrets with hell. We're completely honest, maybe for the first time ever in our lives, and we get to look at it all in black and white. See, God knows that without this vital step of self-awareness that, that we'll, we, we just won't get well. We'll live in denial for the rest of our lives. And worse yet, not get well, we'll just never be able to get close to God who you need to keep you on the road to recovery. Now, where does fear come in and courage with all this? Well, it is scary to put this stuff on paper, okay? Can anybody attest to that? Yeah. Because when I look at my life, I told you, it's terrifying. When I look at my life, it is big 
and it's overwhelming. The task feels impossible. There's too much of it. And I am far from proud of it. And there's always a few things that we always say, I am going to take this to the grave. There is never anybody who is ever going to know this, ever, ever, ever. Anybody have a few of those things? Come on. So the work, the fourth step, because of the fear involved, and it says we, 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 we've made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves to get over that fear, I need courage. I need courage. Now, courage, any time I say the word courage, I can't help but think of the Wizard of Oz. I don't know. Is, is it just me? I don't know. I always think of the Wizard of Oz, you know, the poor cowardly lion, and he's always looking for what? Courage, right? And in fact, he makes this amazing speech in The Wizard of Oz. If you have never heard this amazing speech, you're going to have to look it up on YouTube and you're going to have to listen to it. But I'll tell you what, we're going to recreate it here. In fact, I will tell you what the lion said. And would you say courage after each of these lines? Would you, would you help me with this? Okay, let's try this. This is, this, is, this is the speech he made. He says, what makes a king out of a slave? Courage. What makes the flag on the mast to wave? What makes the elephant charge his tusk in the misty mist or the dusky dusk? And what makes the muskrat guard his musk? What makes the sphinx the seventh wonder? What makes the dawn come up like thunder? What makes the hot and tot so hot? What puts the ape in apricot? What do they got that I ain't got? You got that right. You got that right. Because it's hard to find courage. <laughs> Get your pen. Open your, open your folder. The, the definition of courage, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, is, fill this in, courage is mental or moral strength to venture, persevere, and withstand Danger, fear, or difficulty. Courage is mental or moral strength to venture, persevere, and withstand danger, fear, or difficulty. See, because that's what I need, really, to go forward in my recovery. I need the strength to even venture forth into the program of recovery fully and then keep going in my recovery program no matter what. That's perseverance and then withstand the pushback from inside of myself, from others, from the devil, all this pushback, and just keep working my recovery program and going forward. That's courage, and maybe you need that tool too. Now, from time to time, this is me, from time to time, very much like the cowardly, cowardly lion, I have been able to muster bravado. <laughs> bravado is not courage. Bravado is this you know, false kind of courage to bluff my way uh, and pretend that I, I'm, I'm stronger than I am. That, that's, that's bravado. But that's not enough in this situation. No. We need real courage. And it's God. God is the one who can and will give it to us. He will give you courage if you ask him for it because it is his will for you to recover. You overcoming your addiction or affliction, your hurt or your habit or your hang-up, your compulsion that has been killing you physically, spiritually, mentally, or emotionally is God's will for your life. And when you ask God for the courage to work the 12 steps to attain his will for your life, which is to recover, you can rest assured he's going to come through. He's going to give you the courage you need because he's going to give you what you need to fulfill his will. Are you hearing me? Okay. You know, the fourth step is a stumbling block for a lot of people. And that's why today we're going to look at courage in detail. We're going to look at a Bible guy. We're going to look at a Bible guy who got strength from God to venture forth, to persevere, and to withstand danger, fear, and difficulty to follow through with God's will. And this guy's name is Joshua. And you're going to find him in the Old Testament of the Bible, which is the first two-thirds of the Bible. And I believe that he can help us with our courage problem. I want to tell you a few things about Joshua and why anything that went on with him um, thousands of years ago might have anything to do with what's going on with us today. First off, who is Joshua? Well, Joshua was Moses' assistant. His assistant. He did Moses' bidding. Moses was uh, God's right-hand man, and, 
and, and Joshua was Moses' right-hand man. Now, Moses was an important guy. Uh, Moses is credited with writing all the first five books of the Old Testament, uh, and the Jewish religion to this day uh, hails Moses as one of the greatest uh, of all the leaders in the Bible because Moses spoke directly uh, to God uh, on a mountain called Mount Sinai, and Moses brought the Ten Commandments down, right? The Ten Commandments on the, on the, uh, on the tablets down from the mountain, and, and Moses was the channel between God and the Hebrew people as God parted the Red Sea and, and the people fled Egypt um, and their enslavement and walked across the dry bed of the Red, Red Sea. Moses led them uh, right through all that and traveled with them 40 years as they were traveling towards the promised land uh, through the desert. In other words, Moses was a big deal, okay? And Joshua is his assistant. No, that's a big job to be Moses' assistant. But Moses had a bigger job, right? I mean, Joshua was, uh, well, have you ever been an assistant manager? Anybody ever been an assistant manager? Come on, right? It's a great position, you know why? It's a great position because you're sort of in charge. You sort of, you know, got a little authority, but the manager is the one who really takes the heat if anything goes wrong, right, and has to make all the decisions, right? Uh, Joshua was Moses' assistant manager. It probably was a pretty good gig, if you think about it, until it came time for Moses to die. Because here's what happened, which got Joshua into a load of stress and fear. Uh, the book of Joshua in the Bible begins chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, like this. It's in your notes. Um, underline it with me. If it's not underlined already, I'm not sure if it is in the notes, but if it's not, underline it. Um, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, here's the underline, the time has come for you, underline that, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. Now, to back up just a minute, I, I, wanna, I want you to get some perspective on what's going down here. A few months before Moses died, the people of Israel were counted. There were about 600,000 men. Uh, so this means that with women and children, there were probably about two million folks uh, waiting for someone to lead them into the promised land. A lot of people. And as for the size and the condition um, of this promised land that they're supposed to go into, that, that lay across, by the way, a giant river called the Jordan River, uh, well, the promised land encompassed 60,000 square miles. Uh, just to put it in a modern understanding, that would be like all of present-day Israel plus all of Palestine plus some of Egypt and Syria, plus all of Jordan, plus some of Saudi Arabia and Iraq. A lot of land. Are you getting the picture of the scope and the depth of the project of getting the Hebrew people into the promised land? So here's Joshua, up to now an assistant manager. And now God speaks to him. Uh, up to now, God has spoken only to Moses, but now God is speaking to Joshua. Yikes. And God says, in essence, all this people, uh, all these people, all this land... Uh, the time has come for you to step up now, Josh, because Moses is dead. It's your time. It's up to you. Now, honestly, if you really think about it, how do you think Joshua must have felt about this? Imagine being Joshua. Yes, if you're Joshua, I think over your time as Moses' right-hand man, you've probably done some big, brave, courageous things. I'm sure you can read the Bible yourself. Please do open it up and find out that all the things that Joshua did. But how do you think he feels now? There's no Moses to take the heat. There's just him. Two million people, 60,000 miles of land already occupied by other people who probably aren't going to take too keenly to just moving out and letting all of these two million people uh, just move in. And by the way, it's on the other side of a huge Jordan River. How do you get them over there, Josh? I have no idea. I think Joshua probably had some fear. I don't know about you, I think so. This is a big, impossibly complex situation. In fact, this feels a lot like my recovery sometimes. Big and impossibly complex. I just can't get through it. But God has a word for Joshua. And I don't know, maybe God just senses his fear because recorded in Joshua 1, 6 through 9, we hear the voice of God to Joshua again. Be prepared to underline, look in your notes with your, with your pen, underline, when I ask you to, please. Be strong and courageous, says God. Underline that. Be strong and courageous. For you're the one who lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. 
Underline it again. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Can you underline obey all the instructions? Do not deviate from them. Oh, underline that. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or the left. Then you'll be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Oh, underline that. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then, oh man, circle that. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. And now can you read this last part uh, with me together? This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Can you underline for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go? Be courageous. See, God gives Joshua a huge task. It's scary. But God says, I have given you every tool you need to bring your people into the promised land. Everything you need to know, you have already been taught by your mentor, Moses. Everything you need to know is in the book. All you have to do is take a look. It's in the book. And God says, I will be with you every step you take. And so Joshua, it's not in here, but later on Joshua says, okay, God, if you say so. And he takes a deep breath, and then he becomes willing to go forward and obey the Lord. But there's so many obstacles. There's so many obstacles. For instance, I want to tell you some of the obstacles that Joshua had. Um, the rulers of the promised land. Now, to the south of the promised land, uh, there was the Egyptian empire. And then to the north of the promised land, there was Mesopotamia. But the promised land isn't ruled by any of these. That would have been bad enough. No. In fact, there is no one power that actually rules this section of land at all. Instead, it is made up of 31 fortified city-states scattered all over the area, each ruled by its own king, each king that will need to be conquered. And as if that's not bad enough, the Jordan River separates them from the land. What in the world? How are they even going to get there? Can you just hear Joshua asking, how do I get over these obstacles? God, how do I do it? How do I do it? He needs courage. So I want to chat, you and me, just for a second. Can we chat? Can we, can we just chat? What is it that you need, need to do? What is it that you know you need to do when it comes to your recovery program? What do you need courage to go forward with right at this moment? What is it? You know what it is. God is telling you like he told Joshua, the time has come for you. The time is now. For some of you, it might be find a sponsor. The time has come for you to find a sponsor. For some of you, maybe it's to venture out into some traditional recovery programs because you need more exposure to recovery than just on Friday night. You know you're a little stagnant. You might need AA or Al-Anon or Sex Addicts Anonymous or another group to help you grow. Or, or maybe some of you are looking at that fourth step and the idea of listing the truth of your life in black and white, it terrifies you. But it's time. The time has come. What is that thing that is right in front of you that you know it needs doing, but it's looming, feels ominous, feels huge, feels impossible? It needs to be handled. Something must change, but you're afraid. Maybe you're paralyzed. Maybe it's something from long ago. Maybe it's a memory, maybe an abuse. It's time to look at you, maybe at your codependent behaviors with your spouse or with your children, your secret sins. See, God wants you to get well from these things. Uh, you know, the fear of writing down the truth can be really real, but God is calling you to that next step of your recovery, and he's promising you. He says, I promise you, I will give you the courage you need to take that step if you ask me. He'll give you the courage to take that pen and paper and begin that step. So ending, um, what happens uh, to Joshua conquering the promised land? Well, the short end of the story is that he conquers it. 
He does it. You'll have to read the story to find out how because it's wild and wicked. But here's what I can tell you. Here's what, I, here's what I can tell you that Joshua doesn't do, okay? After he hears God's specific about, specifics about how to actually conquer the promised land, after he receives courage from God, here's the thing that Joshua doesn't do. Joshua doesn't say, that sounds stupid, God. Joshua doesn't say, it's never going to work. Joshua doesn't say, everyone's going to laugh at me. Joshua does not say, I, I have a better idea than you do about this, God. Let me put it off, God. No. Joshua, who now has figured out that he has not been promoted to manager now that Moses is dead, Joshua, who now realizes he is still an assistant manager, only now he is serving God, who is the real manager, Joshua trusts God and goes boldly forward with God's crazy, amazing, holy plan, and it is a wild one. Read about it and see, and if you're not good with the Bible, Google it, hello. You know, it took me three years of making a lot of mistakes in AA to realize that it was time for me. It took me three years, made a lot of meetings, but I had to become willing to overcome my fear of working the fourth step. And, and, and I finally did. I didn't even know Jesus yet, uh, but still God, when I became willing, he still gave me enough courage to take a peek at the mess I had made of my life through my addiction. And it wasn't an easy look. I had ruined innocent lives. I'd made mistakes I could never fix. But I knew that it was the next step that was necessary for me to recover. And as I took each of the steps, God gave me new courage for the next one. And now here I am telling you this story. That's how that works. And God still tells me each and every step of the way as I grapple with new fears, have courage. I am with you wherever you go. You know, as the band comes... I want to open the altar here because I want you to come to the altar and I want you to think about your own next step. What is God asking you to do? Maybe the fourth step, it may be another step, it may be getting a sponsor, maybe going to more meetings. Think about the action you know you need to take in your recovery, but you're paralyzed by fear, or maybe it's rebellion. You know, this altar is open to come and ask for and receive the courage that you need from God. The fourth step is scary, but it's not too scary for God. You know, when you come and you ask God for courage at this altar and you leave, don't, don't limit God. Don't just, don't just say, that's all, I'm just asking for God. Then go into your meetings and ask, tell, tell, tell the people in your meetings that you need courage to go forward. I tell your sponsor you need courage. Get, get, get courage from your sponsor. Pray, read the Bible, hear what God is telling you so that you can have a special connection with God and receive the courage that you need. I promise the only people who have not gotten constant instruction and courage from God for the next steps to take are people who have not ventured out to seek him and persisted in following him when he speaks and then withstood the pushback as they went. So remember, this is God's command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The altar is open. As I pray, please come forward. Get the courage that you need from God. God, we're, we're here and we're coming on our knees um, so that you can speak to us. You can speak your power and your strength into us because we know that your will for us is to fill us with abundant life and joy, not for us to be afraid to go forward, but, but for us to go forward with joy because you're awaiting us in that next step. So God, as we pray, uh, fill us with what we need. Um, allow us to go forward um, in your mighty power, not in ours, because we don't have any of that. We've already worked our first step, God. We know we ain't got none of that. But in your mighty power, Lord, fill us today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.